up on osteoporosis. Um, I'm going to do a quick um, test to see if you guys have been paying attention all day. So Dr. Bruder got her MD and MPH degrees at Tufts University in Boston uh, and did residency and, residency and fellowship in geriatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle. Who else does that sound like? Thank you. Okay. Well, then never mind. So we don't have a bio on Dr. Bruder because it, it, was, it was Dr. Um, Glazer. And we were like, wow, they must have gone to school together. Well, that's just hilarious. That is hysterical. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You employed it well, man. So, nah. That's so impressive. Yeah. All right. Okay. We're going to let Dr. Yeah. Bruder introduce herself. Myself. Okay. <laughs> Hi. So I was at the VA all morning and uh, saw some interesting cases in the endocrine clinic, and then I had to go teach medical students, and now I'm here. So I grew up in New Orleans. And I went to, uh, I was first a nurse before I went to medical school. So I went to Charity Hospital School of Nursing. And then I went to LSU Medical School. Uh, went over to Virginia to do my residency and then Colorado to do my fellowship. And then I came here to join the big bone group over at the university, uh, Dr. Greg Mundy et al., who were the, uh, was there in the mid 90s. And then his group left and I stayed. And so I've been doing osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease stuff. It's my passion and my, what I do. This thing, though, may fall, it seems like. Anyway, to make a comment on the yoga stuff, so I, every patient I see for osteoporosis, even my youngsters, when they come in, I have them do the stand on one leg test to see how their balance is. And so I tell them to stand on one leg and then move the tree around and see if they can still balance. And um, of course, many older, that was all on one foot, by the way. So, and it, but I don't have heels on, so I can't claim that. But um, anytime when I, uh, when I see that they have poor balance, of course, I then have them do exercises and, well, sort of exercise, at least practice balancing while they're watching television to stand by the sofa and hold on to the sofa and try and stand on one foot and the other foot for a minute at a time. And then when they get good at that, to kind of do the tree blown in the breeze, uh, which are yoga poses. Uh, one thing with yoga, I used to do yoga all the time until I developed a spondylolisthesis in my back from trying to do too many back bends. Not that I did back bends, but you know, and stuff. So, so it is. Uh, so I don't do it anymore, and my back is fine now. But. Be careful with that forward bending, the forward fold, um, because it really can't be bending to put pressure on the anterior part of the spine, because that's how compression fractures occur. So you gotta be careful with your um, patients who have, or with you, if you have osteoporosis, to be careful about the forward fold. And then if you have other spine issues, of course, to be careful about the extension poses. So that's, thought I'd throw that in. I have no idea what you talked about, though, so you may have said all that. But that was interesting. Sorry I missed that talk. Um, so let's see. I guess that goes forward. So these are my ob objectives. Um, whatever, I think I sent a handout, so you should have a handout. Um, but uh, I added this to recognize a bone attack. So I just came back from the bone meetings in Houston. And although we've talked about the bone attack now for maybe a little over a year, it sort of resonated a little more now because they're trying to get these fracture liaison services going on in the hospital. Because even though I grew up, um, well, grew up, I've been doing this in order to practice primary prevention with osteoporosis, meaning to identify people at risk, intervene to protect, to prevent fractures from occurring. But we're still doing a horrible job with this. So we decided then to take another attack and talk about secondary prevention. So, and that's real important with the elderly. So if someone has a atraumatic fracture, and I'm thinking of hip fractures, spine fractures, um, that they have had a bone attack. So we have to treat them as seriously as we treat people with heart attacks. Okay, so they have to be placed on medicines to prevent another fracture from occurring. And we know that we can do this with the, with the medications that we do have. Um, in, the majority, in the 
majority of individuals. There are still some that will not respond. But anyway, so if you're going to take home anything here, take home the fact that once your patient or you develop an osteoporotic fracture, which is an atraumatic fracture, um, that they need to be evaluated and treated. So y'all could go to sleep, go home, whatever from now, <laughs> but that's, that's the big point I want to make today on the first slide under the objectives. Okay, uh, these are my disclosure. I have no farmer relationships, uh, but I am a member of the ISCD and we're the ones that have been promoting bone mineral density testing. So I think bone mineral density testing should be done in order to identify patients at risk for having fractures so that you can intervene to prevent those fractures from occurring. Um, but that means you have to do bone density testing to do that. And this society is all about bone density testing. So we're sort of self-promoting ourselves uh, with that. So I totally get that. So that's why. So we're going to start off with the case, a little screen. That was supposed to be a full um, outline, but evidently that didn't get put up. Oh, oh I know. Ah, that's why. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> This is what I'm going to go through today, okay? So we're going to start off with the case. So this is a 54-year-old Caucasian woman with a moderate, do I have a computer anywhere else? No. With um, moderate hot flashes and the last menstrual cycle was um, a year ago. Now, when I looked at this yesterday before I sent it to Mark, I realized, you know, this is a geriatric symposium, so I'm a little off here. But a lot of you are in this category, so 54, so at least you'll take something home from it, okay? But we can talk more about the elderly. Uh, so the risk factors for osteoporosis are included here. She does not have fractures, so when you talk to someone who has osteoporosis or you're going to counsel them or treat them for osteoporosis, you ask about personal history of fractures and any fracture after the age of 50 that's relatively atraumatic is considered to be an osteoporotic fracture until proven otherwise. If they have a strong uh, family history of osteoporosis, in her case, she does. Do they smoke and drink? Both of those are big risk factors, whether it's former smoking and drinking or current. Because former smoking and drinking, if they had a problem with that while they were growing up, then chances are they did not obtain, obtain their adequate peak bone mass. Or they didn't, do not have a good bone mass to start off with if they had this um, these risk factors. Do they take glucocorticoids, so prednisone, hydrocortisone? Do they have rheumatoid arthritis? Rheumatoid arthritis independent of taking steroids is a risk factor for osteoporosis. <clears throat> the other risk factors would be kidney stones, and then there's a whole bunch of other disease entities and medications that can do it as well, and we'll go over that later. Uh, she's taken 1,000 milligrams of elemental calcium and a multivitamin a day. Usually the multivitamins will have an additional 200 to 500 milligrams per tablet. Um, so she may be taking, you know, enough or maybe a little too much, especially with the new data that's coming out saying just because some is good, mo is not mo better. So got to be careful. We don't want to overdo it. So it should be 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium in diet and supplements. So if you're getting three glasses of milk or yogurt or cheese a day, you don't probably have to take any supplements because it can do more harm. Likewise with vitamin D, vitamin D is usually in the calcium supplements as well as in the multivitamins. And just because some is good, mo is not mo better. And so you could get into problems with vitamin D intoxication which has detrimental effects, which we can discuss later. She walks and she has a BMI of 22. So these are her um, spine, hip, um, T-scores. So lowest T-score that we see here is minus 2.1. So according to the WHO criteria, based on T-scores, she has osteopenia, but what we'd like to really say is she has low bone density. Osteopenia is a radiographic diagnosis where you throw up the radiograph and you see washed out bones. That's osteopenia. Osteo, low bone density, which we used to refer to as osteopenia, which I still slip and use it, um, could still be normal for that individual. So not necessarily that they have a disease state. And then osteoporosis is if that T score is less than minus 2.5. 
okay? So she has osteopenia. But what I usually like to encourage, and I know it takes a lot of time and many people do not do this, and I totally get it, but I still encourage you to look at the images. Well, first of all, before doing that, with someone with osteopenia, would you treat that individual? Anybody wants to give them, let's say, Fosamax, Alendronate? Somebody does. Oh, somebody. Some, some doctors do. So the guideline now is if someone has osteopenia and she has no risk factors except for the family history, um, you would go to this calculator on the website and it's FRAX, uh, just Google FRAX and it comes up, F-R-A-X, and it's a World Health Organization um, tool uh, in order to identify people at high risk for fractures who do not have access to bone mineral density testing. So that was the goal of doing this. Uh, but they do have a place that you put in the bone density test. And then you can calculate and see based on the U.S. economics, how much we're willing to spend to prevent a hip fracture will determine what are the cutoffs. It determines the cutoffs for who should be treated or not. So you go to the website and you plug in all these different uh, things, the age, the sex, the weight and height, all the risk factors that uh, the arrow didn't come up there. And then um, if they have the bone density, you go ahead and plug in the bone density at the femoral neck on your bone density um, report. And then you hit calculate, and it comes up with these numbers here. So this gives a 10-year probability um, of having a fracture, a, a probability of having a fracture over the next 10 years at either a major osteoporotic fracture or a hip fracture. And so what do these numbers mean as far as treatment goes? If the major osteoporotic fracture is greater than um, 20, then it's economically feasible to put them on generic alendronate in order to prevent a fracture from occurring. And likewise, if the hip fracture is greater than 3%, then they probably should be treated because the cost of the treatment um, is, is, would be helpful and cost effective. Um, in preventing fractures from occurring. Other than that, then you don't have to treat. At least that's the guidelines. You know, you gotta use your clinical judgment because again, if someone, even though it has steroids here, it doesn't say whether they're on 7.5 milligrams of, of prednisone or are they on 40 milligrams of prednisone. So that may change your opinion whether you should treat that individual or not. So if someone's on 40 and they just started 40, you know they're gonna lose and, may, and lose rapidly. So, but I want you to encourage to look at these, um, the images. So if you're at the VA, you go to Vista Imaging, you pull up the bone density, click on it, and you could get these images come up. Um, <clears throat> and what I wanna point out here, the point to make is that um, uh, when you look at the spine, it should be straight. You should see uh, L4, which is at the, around the, air, the same level as the iliac crest, L4 and 5. You should see a little bit of T12, which is where the ribs are, and it should be straight and in the center of the table. The outline of the bone should outline truly bone, and the intervertebral markings should be the same. Now, this is what I do whenever I see a patient. I look at the images. I never look at the report, but I just want to empower you to maybe look at this, especially if something doesn't make sense. Um, and what you can see, uh, in addition, you look at the individual vertebral bodies, and going from L1 to L3, it should go up as you go down because the density gets higher as you go from L1 to L3. This works fine here. And many times L4 is lower than L3 because the area of the vertebral body is larger. So the area is the bottom number, the denominator, so it makes the density um, smaller. The T-scores should all be within one standard deviations from each other. And just already looking at this, you see that L1 and L2, really this fulfills the criteria for osteoporosis. You never wanna look at just one vertebral body, so you wanna look at an average of at least two. Um, this is lower, but it's still, um, I mean it's minus two two, and then this is greater than a standard deviation compared to L3. So when I look at this, I go back to the image, and it looks like maybe there's some sclerosis there. So maybe some spondylolisthesis, some arthritis, DJD, disc disease. Sometimes you can even see a fracture on these imaging, you know, when you have a short, uh, 
a um, decrease in the vertebral heights of one of these compared to the other. So, so having looked at the image, um, I would then go back, oh, uh, go back and uh, where where's my thing? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it's right here. I so, thought it was on there. So if I look at L1 to L3 and throw out L4, the T score is minus 2.5. So that fulfills the criteria for osteoporosis. So independent of what that FRAC score is, we know that you should be treated if you have osteoporosis by T-score cri criteria. Um, so in addition, you also look at the femoral neck, and this has a low bone density based on the T-scores of the femoral neck. The femoral neck area is this rectangle area, the bone within this rectangle area, and the total goes from this top line down to the bottom line the intertrochanteric stuff that was reported on old bone density images is this part here, the lower line of the femoral neck in this line, and the total, um, the warts triangle is this um, square area here in the middle. But the sites that we're interested in when we look at the bone density is the spine, either L1 to L4 is the default, or a variation of L1 to 3, L2 to 4, you know, L1 to th uh, 2, um, based on what the images look like. And not all radiologists look at the images close enough to do that. So it's just, you know, I mean, I always tell my trainees to look at all images, x-rays, MRIs, ultrasounds, that kind of stuff. I know you don't have time all, you know, to do that, but just to consider there may be a time when you should be looking at it. Okay, so now she has, um, fulfills the WHO criteria for osteoporosis. So it's defined as a skeletal disorder compromised by, um, characterized by compromised bone strength, and bone strength is uh, either bone density or bone quality issues. Those go together. We measure bone density readily with the bone mineral density test. Bone quality issues, we will be measuring those as we move forward. The bone meeting talks about now doing a trabecular bone score, which you can put special software on the bone density machine and come up with some um, uh, calculation of how the trabeculi are connected to each other. Um, there's also these other new modalities, HRP, QCT, so getting high resolution peripheral um, um, CTs to also um, look at more of the volume and the cortices and the porosity of bone. We also do bone markers of turnover that also give an idea if someone's actively losing bone and will affect quality. Um, prevalence of osteoporosis is here. It's big. This is an old study, but it's still relevant today, and this is based on bone mineral density testing. This is the problem, it costs millions of dollars and it's gonna to continue to cost more as we, are, of course, are aging. So what about screening? Uh, we have a bunch of different societies that talk about who should have one of these bone density testing. The National Osteoporosis Foundation, International ISCD, or the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force. So this is really the NOF and the ISCD guidelines as to who should get bone density. So anyone in the geriatrics age should have a bone density done based on these guidelines. And Medicare will pay for a bone density with, with women over the age of 65. It still hasn't jumped on the bandwagon to measure men, um, although we make the recommendations in the societies that men over the age of 70 should have a bone density testing done. And then if you're less than those ages, if you have risk factors, and the risk factors are numerous. And it's not recommended for someone who's premenopausal without risk factors. So the, the um, United States Preventive Service Task Force um, also made some guidelines, which I think is really interesting. So they said women over the age of 65 should have a bone density test, and test but if you're less than 65, they recommend that you go to the FRACs. And then you plug in all the characteristics, all the risk factors without the bone density because you don't have it, and you hit calculate. And if the numbers are equal to what a normal 65-year-old risk, fracture risk is, then you get a bone density. And I think it's a very cool way of doing it. I don't see that many people have jumped on this to do this yet, but 
<clears throat> it's out there. It came out in 2011, so I would think insurance, you know, payers would have jumped on it, um, but they haven't. Uh, but anyway, so to make that point, uh, this is a 65-year-old, no risk factors, and these are her numbers. And so if someone's less than 65 um, and you put in their risk factors and it comes up to be great, this or greater, then a bone density testing is, is indicated. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, what about prevention? Um, vitamin D is the big hot topic these days, right? So how many of you are on vitamin D? Everybody. How many of you measure your pay? Well, that guy that's sleeping over there isn't on it, but no. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, so how many of you measure it in your in patients or you've seen vitamin D levels measured? Probably everyone should raise their hand on that because everyone gets it done, it seems like. Okay. So with osteoporosis prevention, we know um, that calcium and vitamin D, not just in the adult, you know, throughout life, you know, this osteoporosis really, in order to obtain peak bone mass that's good and of good quality, you have to have adequate nutrition when you're growing up. And so that means adequate calcium and vitamin D. We don't usually supplement kids per se because hopefully they're drinking milk and they're eating good. But again, it's something to be aware of. Um, exercise is really important, so kids that are couch potatoes have lower bone densities as adults, you know, um, people that play the video games versus getting out doing soccer. Um, but the exercise recommendation um, for adults, oops, include um, the exercise 30 minutes a day. So how many of you exercise every day? So a handful. So I tell my patients, exercise is like eating and sleeping. You don't think about not eating, you don't think about not sleeping. So you should exercise todos los días, every day. As long as that's the goal, you know, 30 minutes every day, an hour every other day, you know, is, is fine. But to get into that habit, it's all about habits. You know, there's good habits and bad habits, so that's the good habit. Um, and then we uh, talk about balance training. Um, before and then of course weights are, are good like you know the uh, five pound weights as um, uh, as it was mentioned you do not want to go to just go and get a trainer that doesn't know about if you're elderly to go say go get a personal trainer it's got to be someone who knows what they're doing um, with um, the frail elderly if that's the case and I send a lot of my patients to physical therapy um, to get the exercise routine going. And then, of course, fall prevention, very important. And if you have good balance, this helps with fall prevention, avoiding risks, and you know what they are. Um, so we know that calcium and vitamin D are essential for bone accrual and maintenance, uh, and the deficiencies in children result in rickets and can result in osteomalacia as adults, although we hardly see that because our milk is fortified with vitamin D. Um, but people who don't get milk or people who don't get out in the sun can have profound vitamin D deficiency. Um, it's important when you take calcium to take it with meals because it's better absorbed in an acid environment. Calcium citrate can be taken on an empty stomach without an acid environment and that's why that is considered um, better to some individuals, but it's both the same. And calcium, even if you're on an H2 blocker or a PPI and you're blocking your acid secretion, you can still absorb calcium if you take it with food because you need acid to digest your food. You never really turn off that acid production. <clears throat> As excess calcium intake, hypercalciuria, kidney stones, but then the recent stuff talks about atherosclerotic heart, you know, vessels. So deposition of the atherosclerosis in your vessels and increased heart disease. Uh, vitamin D um, in, is important to absorb calcium and phosphorus from, from the gut. The recommended daily allowance um, in the um, past was 400 international units a day. Um, it increased to a whopping 600 now but it's recommended in the bone field to at least um, make it 1,000 for people at risk for osteoporosis, 1,000 units a day. Remember, if you take too much vitamin D, it can result in hypercalcemia. 
Too much vitamin D not only will cause the absorption from calcium in the gut, but it also increases bone resorption, so it can lead to osteoporosis. So there's a bimodal uh, effect of vitamin D. You need it for adequate bone mineralization and calcium absorption, but too much causes bone loss, increases bone resorption, and that's one of the factors that leads to hypercalcemia. Is it hot in here, or am I having a hot flash? <laughs> Whew. It's warm. I stopped my estrogen this month. You know, <laughs> I know that's too much information, but I think I have to go back <laughs> um, and protect my bones. Um, so this is the Institute of Medicine um, recommendations, um, current recommendations from 2010 that came up for what's adequate um, calcium. And so that's the adequate calcium in, uh, for the different age groups, 1,000 if you're under the age of, um, where am I? Yeah, under the age of, um, oh yeah, males, okay. I was seeing that 50 to uh, 70, 1,000, but that's males, yes. So males get 1,000 a day, and women go up to 1,200 after the age of 50. And these are the sources in food uh, that you would get, and it's important to, kind of go over individuals so that they don't take too much in their supplements to know what they're taking in, in their foods and more food. And of course, sardines is a big hit always in South Texas. We all eat sardines, right? No, of course not. <clears throat> okay, does everyone know how to read labels? And again, I think this takes a lot of my time in clinic to try and teach people how much they're really taking. So to always remember serving size, you have to look at what the serving, so the serving size is a cup, so this whole package, whatever you have here, has four serving sizes in. So each serving size has 90, so if I eat the whole thing, I'm getting 360 calories. Of course, that's a part with the super sizes and stuff. You know, you get, you get two and a half glasses of Coke um, in a, liter or whatever, you know. So, and again, what they say is calories per serving size, which is eight ounces, you know. So you, that's 500, that's, a, you know, a boatload of calories. Um, but anyway, so the point I wanna make here is the calcium. So if it says 4%, that's 40 milligrams. So if you look at a dairy products, it's usually three, um, excuse me, it's usually 30 percent and so 30 percent will be 300 per serving size same with your supplements one pill or two pills equals per serving size and because what it gives you in the list is per serving size so calcium citrate is usually two pills per serving size calcium carbonate is one pill per serving size so you'll see 600 for calcium citrate and patient comes in and says, yes, I'm taking calcium citrate. I'm taking one tablet twice a day. She's only getting 600 total. She's not taking 1,200 like she or he may think she's taking. Okay? Um, so I talked a little bit about the calcium carbonate and citrate, so I won't go over that, but it's in your handout. But when we talk about calcium, we're talking about elemental calcium not calcium carbonate, the compound. So again, there's another issue that they put on labels is they'll say, in Tums, calcium carbonate, 1250. But it's only 500 per tablet of elemental, okay? Calcium citrate, 20% of calcium citrate is elemental calcium. 40% of calcium carbonate is elemental. So remember, it's a compound, so you've got to look at, are they talking about calcium as, cal as calcium as calcium carbonate is the elemental calcium. But on the, top, on, the, on the label, it'll say, you know, calcium carbonate 1250. And you think just one pill then will give you 1250, and it, and it doesn't. Okay, vitamin D, the new guidelines I talked to, it went up to 600. If you're over the age of 70, 80, uh, 800 is the recommended daily allowance. <clears throat> uh, these are the various different um, uh, expert reviews on how much you should get. Uh, Endocrine Society is very generous, which is what I 
belong to. It goes up to 2,000, but really I just recommend 1,000 a day for people at risk for osteoporosis. If they're low, then I supplement them more. So we know where vitamin D comes from. It's the skin, but hopefully we're not out there sunbathing and getting skin cancer uh, in an attempt to get um, bone, um, uh, enough vitamin D. Dark-skinned individuals tend to have a mutation, or should I say the African-American dark skin, and a mutation in the uh, vitamin D um, binding protein. So their levels are lower than a Caucasian. So we really need race-based normal values. So I would be very careful in supplementing an um, uh, African-American that has a low vitamin D level um, because of that. And we know that African-Americans are protected against osteoporosis. They have higher bone densities. They have less urinary excretion of calcium. They don't have secondary hyperparathyroidism. So they tend to be protected anyway. So that vitamin D level, don't just treat the number. Um, and these are your sources of vitamin D, cod liver oil. My mom used to give us that when we were young. Yeah, remember that? It was a yellow pill, and you could chew it, and it tasted really good. Did anyone have that? I remember it. You had liquid? Yeah, she, she, we did liquid, and then she got the pill. So that was good. Okay, salmon. You know, of course, it's got to be the fatty salmon. Uh, anyway, you could read those. Okay. Uh, so when you block, uh, when you don't take in enough vitamin D, then you don't hydroxylate both at the liver and at the kidney. And the measurement for vitamin D status is this one that is hydroxylated in the kidney. Um, and if you block all that, I mean, if you don't have enough, um, and I don't know where, I'll, well, I guess I have the point. I thought I had arrows on this. Let's look. Yes, I do. So if you um, decrease that 125 production, which is here, Okay, we're decreasing that. We don't absorb calcium at the gut, so calcium does not get into the bloodstream, uh, and therefore it doesn't go back and act at the calcium sensing receptor on the parathyroid gland. So if you're truly vitamin D deficient, uh, PTH should increase. As an endocrinologist, I always look at an axis. I look at PTH, serum calcium. I also use, look at urine calcium and I look at vitamin D, that's my, that's my calcium vitamin D axis. So I look at all those things, it's more expensive, um, uh, but to truly know if someone's vitamin D deficient, you really need to know if they have secondary hyperparathyroidism. That means that that vitamin D is affecting the bone because if vitamin D is low, relative low calcium, PTH goes up, and where does it take its calcium from to make the serum calcium normal? The skeleton. And so therefore, that puts it at risk. So what do you do in, gar in everyday practice? Everyone's getting vitamin D levels, but no one's getting PTH levels. Um, I would say if it's between 20 and 30, if you want to do that next step, get a PTH level. If the PTH is normal, and I'm talking about normal, normal. If it's normal, it's not affecting the skeleton. So you, don't, you can't explain that for their bones. If it's single digit numbers, you can bet that their PTH is gonna be high. So you could get it or get, not get it. If it's greater than 30, you're fine. Um, but that 20 to 30 is the, is the um, oop, 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 there you go, okay. So that, uh, this 20 to 30 range is the um, term, or is the range we say is insufficient, but really truly insufficiency would render the PTH high normal or high. And the reason why we change the um, normal values for vitamin D in the past, the lowest, low limits of normal for vitamin D was like 15. And we moved it up to 30. And the reason being is because as you go below 30, you see this deflection in that line? These are all PTH levels. The deflection in the line, it starts, PTH starts going up when someone goes below 30. And that is the only reason why the normal values were changed. And so now we have probably vitamin D is the most 
ordered, the most frequent ordered test, there is, well, testosterone is a close follow-up. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's very frequently ordered and probably doesn't need to be. But also, vitamin D supplements is now up there as being a high prescribing um, drug. So anyway, I don't know what to say about, about this decision to make that, um, but it, it causes more, I think, money spent, and many times I don't think it's really uh, necessary um, to really replete someone that's between 20 and 30, unless, again, they have a high PTH. I'm not going to go over those because of time. Um, so anyway, if their average risk, just administer... 800 to 1,000 units a day, and no need to measure the levels. This is the International Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines. And if they're a high risk uh, for vitamin D deficiency, go ahead and measure it. And who's a high risk? All of these guys. So, I mean, you can probably say all your patients fall into one of these categories, so then you would measure it. It almost seems like everyone at, at the VA, when I see them, they all are like this. Okay. So we have ergocalciferol, 50,000. 50, I just told you the RDA, you know, 600 units. And um, recommendation is around 1,000. And this is 50,000 units a pill. So you can see if you accidentally told someone or if someone misheard you and started taking the vitamin D, the ergo, every day, you would get into problems with vitamin D intoxication readily. Vitamin D, remember, is a fat-soluble vitamin. What's the half-life of vitamin D? A month. If you get toxic, you are screwed. Because it takes how many half-lives to get it out your system? Five. So five months. So you need to get on dialysis. You need to do the drugs, blah, blah, blah. So just be careful. It, and that's why at the farm, uh, is everyone from the VA? I, I don't know. But if, if at the VA you have to, you can't dispense really more than 12 at a time. And it's because I was involved in one of the cases, not that I did it, but hyper, I was, we were called in the hospital because of hypercalcemia on an elderly gentleman, and his calcium was 18. And the pill, this was a, a, when I first got moved here, you know, so like 15 years ago. And the pill bottle, said take weekly, but it was dispensed 30. And being elderly, you take pills every day, right? So anyway, so he got into problems with it and he died. Um, so it's, it's one of those um, quality measures. And so that's one thing, even though I cringe at some of the stuff that they limit us from doing, I think that was a good safety um, 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 net that they've incorporated uh, in when you order vitamin D. Okay, so what about diagnosis and evaluation? This is the bell-shaped curve of everyone's um, bone density. Low bone mass falls between minus 1 and minus 2.5. Osteoporosis is down here. So really, people are, can be normal. This could just be their normal, and that's why we threw out the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Um, when you do a physical exam, I usually tell people that, um, you know, I'm not going to find anything because usually you don't, and usually laboratory tests are normal when someone has osteoporosis. Uh, but this is what you would look for. Um, of course, kyphosis, uh, asymptomatic vertebral fracture, can just show up as a kyphotic individual. Weight loss of hyperthyroidism, tachycardia, hyperthyroidism, blue sclera of OI, goiter, Hepatomegaly, maybe vitamin D deficiency, urticaria, pigmentosis, a mastocytosis, cushionoid, whether it's exogenous or endogenous, glucocorticoid excess, uh, and gait imbalance for the risks of falls. Um, these are the, this is the stuff I do, so I do include a 25 and a PTH with the urine and the blood calcium levels. So. Um, Again, as an, you know, you go to a surgeon, you get surgery, you come to me as an osteoporosis person, you get all this. You know, so I totally get it if, if you don't get all of this, if, if patients come and see you with osteoporosis. How do you do a testosterone 
because one of the most common causes for osteoporosis in men is hypogonadism. Um, optional testing, uh, SPEP, UPEP, multiple myeloma. So if someone is young and they're fracturing and they have osteoporosis, you better consider doing some of these other things. Older individuals that you can explain the bone loss on age and menopausal status or the hypogonadal because they have prostate cancer, you don't really need to look further. You know, but in someone who's young and fracturing or fracturing on therapy, you definitely would want to make sure there's not something else going on. And these are the other things that you would um, think about. Um, so in a study that looked at how many patients had um, secondary causes for bone density uh, in the individuals that they had no history of secondary etiologies, um, 309 of them, when they did do a comprehensive lab testing, they identified uh, at least 32 percent that had some unrecognized factors, and if they included vitamin D's less than 20, it went up to 44 percent. So, um, you know, it behooves us to look for secondary causes in people with osteoporosis. Um, that's just another study. In, um, yeah, I won't go over that. Okay, so this is the evolution of treatment. Um, we've been using estrogen. I started doing the osteoporosis stuff in the mid-90s in Colorado, and we were putting 70-year-old ladies that had osteoporosis on estrogen because um, that's all we had. We had that, and we had atidronate, and we had calcitonin. And so I used it a lot, and it is, it's, it's shown to decrease um, bone loss and protect against fractures. Um, so uh, treatment began with that uh, a long time ago with estrogen. Fluoride had a heyday, and it's mostly was over in Europe, but it showed that the quality of bone that's laid down by fluoride is not good bone. Uh, calcitonin's been around for a long time, and then finally the the blockbuster was when uh, Alendronate or Fosamax was FDA approved in the mid 90s. Uh, and then that was quickly followed by other modalities, raloxifen, residronate, teriparatide, abandronate, zoledronic acid, and then denosumab. And then the future, the ones that are in clinical trial now are the capthepsin K inhibitors, uh, PTH, uh, other PTH analogs, including PTH-related peptide analog, uh, sclerostin inhibitors, and BMP. So still some more to come. But you can see in, when we were trained, all of y'all are about my age, didn't learn about osteoporosis, uh, at least in medical school, didn't know it. And it's only after I got into fellowship that, um, you know, it, we, I, it, because that was in the mid-90s when the um, alendronate was first FDA approved. Um, so the guidelines for treatment, uh, T-scores of less than minus 2.5 at either the spine, the total hip, femoral neck, or the distal radius um, is an uh, indication for treatment. Independent of what the bone density is, if you've had a fragility fracture and you're over the age of 50, you have osteoporosis. So I got an e-consult saying, uh, gentleman, he's like 80 years old with bilateral hip fractures and a compression fractures with osteopenia, or low bone density on bone density testing. Does this person have osteoporosis? Clear what it says. So again, if you could take home another thing here, if they had the fracture, they have osteoporosis independent of what that bone density does. And remember when pa patients, when you get older, you get all this arthritis in the spine and sometimes in fractures then, that you can't use the spine. And the spine is the one that is the site that it has mostly cancellous bone is, and where you're gonna see osteoporosis first. So if you can't use the spine because of all this stuff in their spine, you know, arthritis, fractures, whatever, you, you can't use it. And then you have to look at the hip and many times the hips aren't too bad. Uh, so you have to make that clinical call as to their risks. And then again, as I mentioned before, you do the FRAX calculation, and if the hip fracture is greater than 3% or the major osteoporotic fracture greater than 20, it's warranted, warrants to begin therapy. And the treatment goal is to fracture prevent. So you want to prevent fractures from occurring or fractures that uh, prevent additional fractures. 
If your bone density is stable, that's a good thing because we know that um, the fracture prevention um, is uh, also included with some of the quality issues that these um, medications do with bone to stabilize the bone and prevent bone loss from occurring. So stable or increased bone density is good. If you're losing, then you're a little more concerned about compliance or is there something else going on. And so these are all the medicines that we have that are FDA approved. Um, these are the anti-resorptives. Uh, and these are the, we only have one anabolic and that's teriparatide. Um, but the sclerostin antibody that's in the pipeline is also an anabolic agent that's coming down. This is a summary of its effect on bone with the lumbar spine bone density in yellow and the hip in blue. And they all do a fair, you know, good, good effect on the bone density. But it's the bone attack that we have to really um, be on the lookout for now and make sure we really, 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 really do intervene to prevent those further fractures from occurring. It's not too late to intervene because you know one fracture begets another. And we know that mortality after these fractures are high, morbidity is even, is all, is even higher. Long-term care and fracture, uh, future fractures are increased by 2.5 fold. So all of them have to show in order to get FDA approved, all of the modalities approved for osteoporosis have to show vertebral fracture prevention. And they all do that, which is shown in this slide. But not all of them show hip fracture. It's not to say they can't, don't do it, but this is our endpoint. This is our heart attack, really, is the, the bone attack, is the hip fracture. And so that's what's going to kill people. But we do know spine fractures to increase uh, morbidity, and people have a higher uh, mortality from spine fractures as well. But this is the fracture that, that st starts that slippery slope. You know, once an elderly person and again, you know, always it's always nice to bring in your personal stuff. Once my mom had that fracture, four years later, gone. And it was just seeing her just going down. On my watch, she breaks her hip. On my watch. <laughs> Mama, what you doing? Um, so, um, so in another attempt to kind of identify people at fracture uh, with fractures is to perhaps do some vertebral imaging on people um, independent, again, of what bone density shows or anything. So um, this is, these are new guidelines, again, that came out. And this is just shooting a plain film or doing a, a lateral vertebral assessment that's already in the software of the bone density machines. Um, and do it in all women over the age of 70 and all men over the age of 80. Um, and uh, if, they, if they have a normal bone density. And just to look for occult fractures, because we know that almost 50% of spine fractures are asymptomatic. You know, people have back pain all the time. Do you get x-rays on everyone with back pain? No. Um, but if they're at risk and age is the risk factor for having uh, fractures, you may want to consider doing an x-ray on your elderly just to see if they have it. And if they do, fine, boom, osteoporosis treat. Um, concerns for treatment, every medication that we have, that we ever give patients, there's always side effects that have to be, the risks and benefits have to be weighed out. And, um, and these are the risk factors associated with the treatment. Of course, the most, the treatment that we use most are the bisphosphonates. And uh, oral bisphosphonates cause the GI complaints. And then long-term um, long therapy causes the atypical fractures. Um, ONJ is an issue. I think it's seen, well, I don't think it's seen mostly with the IV forms that are used in the treatment of hypercalcemia of malignancy. So even though we do have reported cases in the doses we use to treat osteoporosis, the risk is less than one in every 10,000 for osteonecrosis of the jaw, so it's rare. But I do now, when I look in people's mouths, I look for dental care. And if they have horrible teeth, I, second, I have second thoughts about starting them on, on a bisphosphonate. 
And again, not everyone, speaking of Obamacare, everyone has to have health insurance, that everyone should have to have dental insurance. Yeah, political here, going up. So, because it's, 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 and there's all sorts of data talking about the inflammation from periodontal disease and poor to affect health. Are y'all having a talk on that? No, I can't talk on it, but yeah, there you go, dental. Yeah, get those dentists involved because they make so much money. <laughs> I shouldn't say any of that, huh? Okay. Okay, uh, that's all I'll say on that. Okay, so treatment, um, is that, what is that, treatment? Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I messed up there. Anyway, this is uh, to talk about atypical fractures. So if someone's been on long-term bisphosphonate therapy, if, you're over, if you've been on it for over, the, over seven years, then this is when this risk goes up. And what is this, atypical fracture? So it's a fracture that occurs in the middle of the femur shaft. How am I on time? Really, but I started early, right? Um, in the femoral neck, I mean, in the femoral shaft. So, where do osteoporotic hip fractures usually occur? The femoral neck and the intertrochanteric area of the of the femoral head. I mean, of the of the femur. So these are mid shaft. In fact, I think I have. So these are down here. Some of them are subtrochanteric, but it's mostly these. So we usually don't break it here. We break it up here. And so what, what's causing that? So the big debate is um, if you go step back, that this bone remodeling cycle of bone resorption is always coupled to bone formation. And you need that. It's going throughout your skeleton. You know, hundreds of units are active right now, and it's based on weight bearing areas of bone, the higher activities. And it takes out old bone and puts in new bone, new fresh bone. And remember, bone has a, a, a balance between stiffness and, and malleability. You know, so you want enough stiffness that you're not gonna break, but you need to be malleable so that you don't break like a chalk, you know, boom. So you wanna have some bend to it. So that's important, the bone remodeling cycle does this, taking out old bone, putting in new bone, making sure it's fresh, taking out old mineral, making sure calcium and phosphate, hydroxyapatite crystal is all, you know, nice and fresh. But if I block that with these anti-resorptives, so that's their action, is to block resorption. If I'm blocking resorption, I'm blocking that protective device of the skeleton. And so you're just gonna get mineral, keep you know, kind of getting old and fragile, and so that's what they think this atypical fracture is. It's not a bone density issue, it's a quality issue with the mineral in the bone. And so it's, um, it's something that we're seeing, and, and there's always been a debate in the bone field about can we ever give too much bisphosphonates? And I always believe the answer is yes. And then I also believe if someone's not losing bone in a young person that comes with low bone density, but they're not losing bone, you do not want to treat them. And how do you make that decision? You watch them conservatively and check a bone density later, do markers of bone resorption. Because again, they could have been that way forever. And then you're just hurting by adding a bisphosphonate or anti-resorptive. Um, so avoid, uh, so what do we do with this kind of stuff? So avoid bisphosphonate treatments in low risk patients. And that's one reason too why not to just treat everyone that had osteo Penia, low bone density, which is what we used to do. The, the cutoff for treatment was less than minus two. So we were treating a lot of people that probably didn't need to be treated, and then that changed with time. And so hopefully we're not treating people who are at low risk. Um, reassess the need for continuing treatment at five years. Now, if someone's moved up into the low bone density stage, a uh, uh, level, and they haven't had a fracture and there's no other risk factors, perfect person to say stop for a while and let's follow. But if someone's fracturing and still has osteoporosis by T-score criteria, you would c continue. 
because uh, you know the, you, there's no data that you probably are you going to do more harm with stopping. So you would continue that. And if they do have this uh, thigh pain, um, to maybe consider getting a radiograph to see if there's a lateral beaking in the femoral shaft to see if they're developing an atypical fracture. So how long to treat? Again, no, got, no data. So the data will be coming, but it's not here yet. So when it's not here, then experts in the field get together and they come up with suggestions um, because we're all asking the same stuff. And I still struggle with this. When do I want to give a holiday? I think I'm getting more brave now and giving more holidays um, than not. But if the fracture risk is low, there's no need to treat. Anyway, if it's mildly increased, incre and what are these mild, moderate to high? You know, I mean, that's sort of subjective, but it probably eventually will be incorporated into the fact, into the fracts, what's, what those cutoffs are. Uh, treat for five years, moderate increase, uh, five to 10, and if it's a high risk, to at least uh, treat up to 10 years. Again, no hard data, just guidelines. And then what about practice improvement? So the, this is a thing that for um, uh, what they're trying to capture and what we need to do is um, for Medicare reimbursement or those, I, I don't know all the political terms for how we get reimbursed and all the bonuses, then Medicare will pay if we fulfill so many. I, I'm tired, it makes me wanna just retire and say forget it. <laughs> So I'm not learning that stuff. I'm just doing what I, what I do, and if I get kudos for it, that's fine. But, um, but anyway, you know, they're measuring how many women over the age of 65 get a bone density, and the percentage of those um, who get a bone density um, or a prescription for vitamin D or osteoporosis medicine after they have a fracture. And so this just goes into capture the fracture. That's another movement that's out there, and the, um, the bone um, fracture liaison services to be incorporated in the hospitals, you know, identify patients who come in with a hip fracture. Orthopedic surgeons, all they do is fix the bone, and that's fine, that's what they're supposed to do. So to allow, to, to have them go ahead and take that next step, I don't think, uh, there's no reason to do that. It comes back to the primary care. But the patient has to be empowered also, and you has to have that diagnosis of osteoporosis on the chart to, to trigger other things that need to take place. And so that's all with the fracture liaison service. And with that, I am done. Thank y'all. Hi, how are you doing, ma'am? Um, you mentioned that you worked at the VA. Uh -huh. I'm also a veteran myself, and I was diagnosed with low vitamin D a few years back. My bones were hurting me, and they had gone down to an eighth. Um, but that was unusual for a 32-year-old female. You know, I had never been pregnant or anything. But what are the statistics right now? Are there any studies being done for the Operation Iraqi Freedom or Afghanistan related to low vitamin D levels? Not that I know of but we see it all the time. So the fact that yours was low, I mean, it's still a cause for concern. The most common uh, reason is that you're just not taking it, you're not out in the sun, or you could have some malabsorption, but knowing that most of vitamin D comes from the skin. But the, your question, your question is no, I don't think that's been, look, is being looked at. Okay. And because it, because it, you'd have to first see how, you know, do a cohort study, how many, um, veterans are low versus age match controls in the general population. And my sense is that it would probably be the same. So are you seeing a lot of young veterans, I guess, my question? I see a lot of young people with well, vitamin D indeed. deficiency. I work not only at the VA, but at okay. the university as well. Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. But I'm curious, you said your bones were hurting? And then when you, t when you took the D, yeah. Did you notice a difference? Well, the first doctor, she didn't pay attention to me, so I asked oh, for another doctor. Don't say that. 
Well, she did it. <laughs> so I asked for another doctor to, she could do this. and she finally tested me for vitamin D. Uh huh. She did, and then it was eight because I was complaining of bone pain. Wow. My feet were hurting. The bone, not you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then, but I have to have mine checked all the time. And again, when I just got it checked, it was 17, which yeah. means I was placed again on the 50,000 right, units right. once very, a week. And then yeah. I have to take my supplement. But no matter what I'm doing, diet, sunshine, or whatever, yeah. I think I'm just going to be for the rest of my life on vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a study at the bone meeting that showed that people, t and I always antidotally noticed it, that if people were deficient and I put them on vitamin D, their bone pain improved. And so there was a study that did show that there was uh, improvement in bone pain if you got your vitamin D, you know, above 20. And it did. Yeah. Yeah. But I can tell, like, right now, my bones, I feel it. <laughs> but I can tell when I'm low now, now that I understand what was going on. But before yeah. I didn't understand, as a young person, why is my bones? See, and it? sometimes if people, I, and I can't t see your physique back there, but if you're <laughs> obese, vitamin D goes into the, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> but I didn't mean for you to stand up. But vitamin D goes into the fat store so that your measurement's going to be low. Um, and so if you, you got to fill up your fat stores before it would be normal in your blood, um, is how I like to explain it sometimes too. So that may have, depending if you had some weight changes or something. And our snack today is enhanced with vitamin D. There's smoothies. It? Smoothies? Yes. Hi, I have two questions. Yes. Um, one is, at one time, long-term care insurance uh, would not cover women with osteoporosis. Um, I don't know if that's changed uh, or if you were um, familiar with that. You mean before you purchased long-term care insurance, you right. had osteoporosis? Right, and so that was not yeah. a coverageable um, um, wow. D problem. Wow, did not know. Okay, and, yeah. and then the second question um, was, are there any race studies, you mm -hmm. know, for, because, you know, when I was looking up there, you know, everything is, is geared toward Caucasian yes. women, yes. and there are other there women are. that, you know, that So they had the NHANE study that looks at African Americans. So we have Mexican Americans, African Americans, Caucasians, and men. And so it does show African Americans are uh, women or have the best, best protection. So y'all, you know, they're at the lowest risk for having a fractures. Okay, and that's surprising forward. because after a certain age, there's lactose intolerance and things like that, so. But I think, I think there's other protective factors, um, like vitamin D mutation, so that even though the vitamin D is low, you're still protected against that. I mean, that's not, your, your free vitamin D is still good, and you still have a good bone protection. It's not to say you guys, you know, African Americans do get osteoporosis, and if they do, then you really have to think about is there something else going on? Because it's uncommon in African Americans. Okay. Oh, good. No Anybody questions. Else? That's good or bad. Oh, huh? no. Back. I'm coming. Yeah, I usually, once you get it above 30, your vitamin D level. I usually put individuals on a thousand international units a day, and then just check it yearly. Okay. Um, but if you're on the high dose, then it's usually for three months, and you check it after your completion of the high dose therapy. So that will be every three months. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.